how good of a liar am I? That's honestly one of the questions with any part I ask, because we lie all the time as people. We lie in little ways, big, we don't want to hurt somebody's feeling, we lie. We're trying to hurt somebody, we lie. We're petty, we lie. We're hiding our vulnerability, we lie. And so like for me, depending on how good of a liar you are as that character will determine how much vulnerability you play the scene. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Frank Mosley is an actor. He sat down with me in a sidewalk cafe in the East Village of New York City to talk about the work. Do you have a typical way you like to begin your preparation process? Read the script. I'm not one of those actors who looks for their name and goes straight through. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't say that with any sense of ego or like, look at me, I'm not doing that thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's more just like, I'm also a filmmaker. And so for me, I realize that I am part of a story. In order to make a movie, it's the lights, it's the writing, it's the direction. You can feel the editing sometimes in the way it's written, you know, on a funny beat and yes. cuts to the next scene, that kind of thing. So for me, I first just want to see the vision as if I wasn't even a part of it, if I'm just reading a script. Now, of course, in the back of your head, you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm looking for the name that will come up and know that that's me Yeah. and read it. But I first just want to see how that character appears in the film. Let's see if it's a supporting part or a smaller yeah. role or whatever it is. It's like, I don't want to go straight to that scene. So for me, it's like, how does that character make an entrance? What has come before him? Mm -hmm. Before he's even arrived. Mm -hmm. Think about Iceman Cometh. Mm -hmm. Before Hickey oh, even yeah. comes into the fucking bar. Yes. There's all this weight. So if he just went straight to his lines, that actor, he's like, well, I got this model. I come in, you know, you miss, you miss the setup, right? You miss oh, the presence. that's a very good example right? for that. So I like the big picture, and so I, I read the script, and then I read it again. Once I know it's something I want to do, uh, I read it again. But that time is just about the character. Uh -huh. I go back and I specifically look at the scenes with my character. Yeah. Um, that's honestly how I start. I mean, that's just the initial step. Yeah. You yeah. know, after that, it's like it's a totally different process for based on who the character is, how much work needs to go into it in terms of how diametrically opposed this character might be for myself, you know, or not. Something I got to learn. Is he somebody who he's a boxer? So I got to learn how to box yeah. or whatever it might yeah. be. Um, that's a whole nother thing. That's a whole other process. Yeah. But uh, because you're a filmmaker, do you actually see things in the script that indicate they might not be a very good filmmaker? And therefore you're thinking, oh, there's a hesitation. It's tough. But so many indies, it's writer directors. Yeah. The directors write the script. Yes. So when you're reading the script, you know, that's the same vision from the same brain. They go hand in hand, script and the film. Yeah. But a lot of films, you know, you get a script that's by the writer, but not the filmmaker. Yes. I don't know how many times I've read a script that was great. You say yes to it and it doesn't turn out to be a good film. Yes. Or vice versa. Yeah. It's such a crapshoot. So that's why so much of it, for me, a, a big thing is, uh, I love rehearsal. I love it, but if there's no rehearsal, the thing that I love and just need more than anything are just conversations, just conversations with the director, just what he's after, what are his goals, keywords, as much prep time as possible. Because you know, you can prep all you want and it's still going to be crazy on set. You're going to yeah. have to throw all that prep out the window. Yeah. Uh, and so it's asking as many questions, being on the same page with the director and knowing that what you're reading is exactly like how you're imagining it in your head. Cause it might not be how the director's imagining it. Yes. You know, the same words, you know, but how's it shot? You find out that scene shot from the back of your head 
you know, the whole time. Yeah. Doesn't affect how you perform the scene necessarily. You're still emotionally intact. It's not like you sound like, oh, it's a bad guy. It's it's like hand acting. This like thing where for a close up, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. But it is. It's still part of you. But then it makes you think if they're only going to see the back of my head for that one scene, then everything before that one scene. How is that affected now? How do I play that? Because for this emotional moment, you only see the back of my head. Mm. So it's all these questions. It's so easy to get wrapped up in. Yes. And I can intellectualize it too much and get into a whirlwind of all that. Yes. But I, I love to do it as long as it's before shooting. Because then once you're on set, it's all about the emotion. Emotion yeah. takes over. Yeah. Just go with yeah. your gut. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is what's insane. Like, so often though you really don't get that opportunity right i mean where you show up on set and you're literally meeting yeah. the person they thrust you in and yeah. you know i mean yeah. it's just so and i know that just the nature of the of the beast you know i mean like yeah. this is just time and money and but it really makes a difference doesn't it i mean i, it I mean really i'm makes a absolutely as a director i love rehearsal as an actor i love rehearsal now that's not to say that there aren't scenes or certain cases certain roles certain you know duets between actors in a movie where you're like this doesn't need rehearsal like we need that we need it to feel fresh and kind of raw and unprepared like i get that and i've done yeah. that as a director and as an actor too yeah but i think like at least just having those conversations sets that bar of, of at least you know where you're going it's a road map yes. that's all it is because yes. anything can change and you know i'm i've never been on tv i've never done tv yet Indies are my world right now, yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean I'll be in anything. But but the indie world, what's funny is that it both has more time for rehearsal because it's indie, right? But it also has less yes. because there's not a lot of money, right? And they think they need to pay you for that. That's right. You know. That's right. Uh, I agree entirely with you about <laughs> how there are some things that you know you want to see for the first time when the camera is rolling sure. the freshness or whatever but I am slowly moving toward the what I call the Mike Lee oh yeah Mike Lee if he was sitting here he'd be yelling at us saying that's not true you know what I mean like yeah. Yeah. there is no such yeah. thing yeah. as we were only going to do it first on, yeah. on camera and it's yeah. like I'm trying to wrap my arms around that with, yeah. with Mike Lee. I mean, we both love Mike Lee's He's word, amazing. right? He's amazing. So he 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 would be saying that the actor can do it. They're professionals. They yeah. can do it. Yeah. Whatever you think is going away. Yeah. If it's not on camera, you know, it can be. I mean, it can be worked out. Like it. I mean, and you as an actor, and the, I mean, I, I'm saying that I'm almost feel like I'm talking to myself here because I'm <laughs> I'm not arguing with <laughs> with you yeah. about this because we're both on the yeah. same page. But can this really be? Are, are we are we missing something? I guess is what I'm saying. Mm. I mean, be, but but you're you're an, you're a very experienced actor, on and you're an experienced director. So you'd be the person to to, to say like. Is this really true, or is this only true for 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 actors that aren't very skilled? Like if, because, and I'm talking about somebody like me, right? If you, if I was in your movie, sure, you got to keep that fucking camera rolling, because sure. Because I'm not gonna be able sure. to do it again. And I, and I <laughs> think, I think that's the the trick is the casting. Like, who are you with? Because when you direct. You can direct an actor who has one methodology versus another. Or an actor who's great on the first take, but the other actor's better at take 10. Yeah. So how do you find that happy balance? Yes. You know, and you're, you're having to constantly go back and forth. Yes. And make sure that, that somehow it's sustained as much as possible in the moment, but then knowing when you construct it in editing. Yes. You know. It could be from take nine from one guy, take one from the other guy. Yeah, yeah. And it works. Um, I do I do think, though, that on an indie level, I've done a lot of indies where there's a lot of improv. Improv to the point where it's not just like a couple lines, like a couple ad-libs, but it's like you're, you're kind of constructing these films mm -hmm. out of improvisations. Mm -hmm. Those are unrehearsed 
right? Yes. So like your whole thing, it's like even though it's like you think about not having rehearsals for a scripted scene, I don't know how many indies I've done where it's been like it's entirely improvised. So as long as you know the character, you've had that conversation, in a way, you are just jumping in. Like you're not mm-hmm. having that. Mm-hmm. You're not having that rehearsal. Your rehearsal was the conversation. Mm-hmm. But once you're there, you don't know what kind of improv is going to come out of it. Mm-hmm. But as long as you know the goals of the scene, that's clear. Yes. You know. Yes. And I think I think it's good to have both. I mean, I think the best films infuse the moments where it's like to the T. They know the script, and then there's other scenes where it's like, you know what? Let's be loose. Listen to your environment. Yes. And try to respond to it. So you know what? Let's toss out these three pages. We're not doing the scene this way. Let's take it to the roof instead. We'll sit mm-hmm. up there. Didn't know it was going to rain today. How does that affect the mood of the scene? Mm-hmm. Just like listen. You know, I think too many people get in this box vision of what they think something's supposed to be. Yes. And I think it takes all the air out of it. Yes. Yeah. And I think what you're talking about, tell me if I'm wrong, is you really have to have a good director when you're doing something like this, right? I mean, absolutely. because if, absolutely. if, if a director is just like, let's see what happens, guys. No, and yeah, just, it doesn't. You know, right? You can't do an improv. You can't, I mean, you can. I've, I've been in some that, that were didn't turn out so well. But you can't do a fully improvised movie with somebody who doesn't have a vision and or you don't trust. It's easier to do it, though, with somebody who you trust and doesn't have a full vision. Because as long as you feel safe with them, Mm-hmm. of like mind and spirit and you know that they have good intentions then you know that if their vision's a little shaky maybe it can get there because the communication's already good mm-hmm. you know I'd rather work with somebody who was a little unsure but a good person yeah <laughs> any day of the week than work with an asshole yeah you know who's got a perfect stringent thing and I'm like you know what like I yeah. you know yeah yeah that energy rubs off real quick, buddy. Like, yeah. you know, it'll affect your performance. Uh, I know in your young life, you were making movies and... Yeah. But when, when did you start to professionally act? And I mean, was this, was this always in line with your filmmaking? The acting with the directing? Yeah. You know, were, yeah. they, were they parallel pursuits or did you, or was one of them just starting out uh, growing f- uh, faster than the other one? Sure. Like? No, they, they were absolutely ignited at the same time. Um, when I was four, my dad had a camera on loan. He was bored. My mom was gone. So we made Wizard of Oz. Whole <laughs> recreation of Wizard of Oz. I played all the parts. I was four years old. And then he showed it to me. He like plugged it into the TV and I watched what we just did. Yeah. And I was mesmerized. I was like, this is, that's like magic. I'm like, wow. And I was like, oh, we can do it like what we watch movies at home. Oh, I can do that too. So all through elementary and all through junior high, high school, I was making movies. But of course you act in them because yeah, maybe I like to act, but it's also like, you, you need, need you, you need, need another need actor. Another you're you're yeah. an actor short. Who's yeah. gonna do that part? Yeah, you know, and you find yourself even as a kid. I would do the heavy lifting, or like I would play the antagonist, or somebody who was a little more intense. So my friend could just kind of stand there in the shot and you know get hit or <laughs> you know all, whatever all you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I'm, just, I'm just like, let me do the, the. Don't worry about it, pal. I got this. Like, just stand there and all. You know. Yeah. Uh, but like that was that was important because it puts you in every aspect of filmmaking where you learn how to light, how to edit, yeah. how to shoot. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean that I'm, I can do all those things in a great way now, but it definitely makes me understand and appreciate them yes. when they're good and why it's important to get collaborators who are good at those things. Yes. So when, as I got older, it's like they were always so hand in hand for me that even when I did high school theater, uh, I would steal friends from the theater department to act in my yeah. films, thinking uh-huh. I'm gonna I'm gonna make movies someday. My films are gonna get bigger, I'm a bigger cast. Someday I want to be a filmmaker. And the acting was always something I liked to do, but I I never thought it was like the one and all. Mm. Uh, but when I was in college, a switch happened because in college we're all making films in film school, 
But then they all find out that I'm an actor. Yes. Hey, Frank, you want to be in my movie? Yes. Hey, Frank, you want to pop up in this scene? So I do it. And then pretty soon, like, oh, Frank's like, Frank's an actor. Yeah. Well, then that leads, the friends I met in college led to all these other relationships of people who then wanted to put me yeah. in something because they needed somebody. And what I realized after a while, Peter, was that then I, my acting in some ways, I could do more acting in a year, in a few months. And it could put me within the indie film sphere that I wanted to be. Because I was still making films. Mm -hmm. But you can't do it as quickly in the time it takes to shoot some, write something, shoot something, edit, release it. But you can act in all sorts of things. Yeah. So I would say they've always run on parallel tracks. But the acting, certainly like as a career, has become my thing that I've mm -hmm. made money off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I get it. You know, I mean, right now, it's the directing is still the thing I haven't made money off of. It's my, it's a passion, but it's mm -hmm. like, maybe someday. Um, and yet the acting has helped me get more people involved to work on my own films. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's kind of strange, but I think people are like, oh, well, I saw you in this thing. You're directing a film, so maybe that means you're gonna be good with your actors. Yeah, so yeah. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Know? Talk to me about what happened about five or six years ago maybe where you were getting a little bit you were feeling the fire going out as you talk about it your passion fire i yeah you know um, when i when i heard this are I was you talking thinking, about acting or the directing acting. yeah okay okay uh and i was thinking well sure he was because you know in the in the film world i mean i don't know how anybody can. i mean well i mean i think it, so the thing is it, you know I, you got to give it your all. Like it, it, you, that's what you do. You do the work. You play yeah. the part. You commit to the role. You give it your all. And I, had, I had been in a few things where um, I really gave some things my all, and then the films either weren't finished, mm. or they never saw the light of day. And I got upset about that. Yeah, that, that's and, hard. And I had to think about it for a second, and something hit me. Something was like. If this were theater, you know you're gonna get seen. Right. It's not documented, it's not archived, it's not a movie. You don't yes. go back and watch it. And that's okay. Right. The ephemera of theater it reached the audience. was okay because it knows what it is and it knows it's gonna fade away as soon as it's over. Yeah. Right? But that's okay, you know what you're in for. Yeah. But as a film, you make something and you work so hard because you, A, want it to get seen, but B, hope that it lasts and that it can spread beyond a decade, right? So I it was burned out because I felt like I was putting in a lot of work into these roles. Doesn't mean I regret those roles. Doesn't mean I didn't learn something. I mean, I still got to perform and grow. Yeah. Make some friends along the way. Um, but I also knew that I, I needed to be in something that was going to matter, yeah. something that was going to... And so what I did was um, I, I did a play. I went to theater. And um, I say I went to it, but it was actually a gift because my buddy in Dallas was putting on a, an original work that he wrote uh, about John Wilkes Booth. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's the only play I've done since being in high school. Even since then, this is the only play I've done. Now, I, I would love to do more theater, but it came at a time where it was like, I need to just do a play. I need to yeah. get away from film. And know that I'm gonna have a connection yeah. with an audience. So he uh, he approached me and he was like, Frank, I know you probably got films, you know, you like doing indie film stuff, that's your jam, but you wanna do this play? And I was yes, I cut him off. I was like, it, was, it doesn't even matter it what was, it is. Mm -hmm. I did that play and I came out, I felt so rejuvenated and so refreshed. Mm -hmm. What was it about that that rejuvenated? It was an audience connection, knowing somebody was, that, was seeing was the performance. Yeah. Even once. Yeah. Uh, and again, knowing that knowing that it would fade away as soon as we did it was okay. You know, right. which like it was that the uh, with the mandalas, you know, and they put it together, and as soon as they finish yeah. the last piece, they destroy it. Like to yeah. me, that's the beauty of theater. Yeah. Um, as long as that's your intention. Right. But it's frustrating when it's a film. Right. It doesn't get done. Right. Or seen. Right. Uh, but I felt so rejuvenated then, and also getting to play two totally different roles then got me more excited to just 
go for as many different kinds of parts mm. as I could find. Mm. You know? So like that uh, that like is the other thing it did for you. Then yeah. it, it 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 made you realize what what you can do. But I mean, but it didn't send you send you back to the theater again, though, did it? No, it didn't. <laughs> is that interesting? It gave me a, a gracious shot in the arm yeah. that I needed. I was thankful for, uh, and I would love to do theater again. I, I even thought about doing one right before I moved to LA. I thought about doing one, um, um, and I'd like to do it someday. But film is my. That's my, yeah. that's my that's my place. Is there some reason why you don't put yourself in your own films that much? Yeah. What is that about? I, uh, some people can do it great, you know. I know, you know, Jim Cummings, uh, all these actors, yes. you can just, it's a dance for them. Yes. The camera is there for them to pivot from one side to the other. They swing around like a lamppost and they, <laughs> yeah. they do it with a lot of grace a lot of these yeah. actor directors for me uh the way my brain works i can't i can't compartmentalize to that degree when i am directing a couple things first i want to see the whole frame i don't want to think about me then having to go around the camera and be on the other side and act i got to see the whole thing yeah makes you more aware second thing is I don't, I don't feel the need to be in it if I'm already directing. I'd rather work with a friend, cast a friend who's been looking for work, or put somebody who I've always wanted to work with a role for them, or make a new friend, cast yeah. somebody else. But it gives you that distance and that remove mm -hmm. where you can just focus on the film. Mm -hmm. um, the the emotional swing from thinking as a director. And then to having to be in the moment, yeah. I can't do it. Yeah, and yeah, some yeah. people, some people can. Um, I think the other thing, though, uh, Peter, is that I I feel like there's a there's a part of me that, as an actor, needs room. I'm not one of those actors who um, can turn it off like a switch. When you know you're doing an emotional scene, you're in yeah. tears, and you're like, "All right, we're good. Let's go for lunch." And like you wipe the tears off. I can't do that. I'm in awe of actors who can do that amazing but me i need a ramp in time mm. and i need to ramp out mm. you can't ramp in or out if you didn't have to deal with the light and then yeah. go outside and do all this stuff so then i start becoming self-conscious yeah. of my performance That's and then killer. as you become self-conscious you become you could become anxious you're like maybe i'm fucking this up or whatever mm -hmm. whatever it is mm -hmm. um but i like the separation because I, I think they're two totally different parts of me um all this to say, the joke is, I just directed a short two months ago that I'm in. Really? Buddy of mine wrote it. Wow. Buddy and we co-directed. Oh, interesting. And we co-starred. No, so that must have helped so you a little that bit. That helped yeah. me, and it was an easier way to do that thing. But even after doing it, Peter, I immediately was like, I don't want to <laughs> do this again. <laughs> but how does directing actually help you as an actor? Directing helps me as an actor because I know, again, it kind of goes back to me reading the script at the very beginning and what I look for. I think about the big picture. Yeah. So I know what I, I know what the, what the director may need for me that may feel weird. You know, it's the classic old story, especially with yeah. young actors who are a little green, yeah. is that the, act, the director's like, I need you to look this way. I know it feels unnatural. Yeah. But it looks better on camera. Yeah. And say the line. Now, I know you're not looking at your other actor, but you're doing this thing. You got to trust me. Yes. So I think that's just a very you know easy yeah. example. But it's like, but I think as a as an actor, I know, okay, the filmmaker and me understands where they're at and how yes. they need to shoot this yes. or what they need for the scene. Yes. Because the actor is not everything. The actor is just a part of the scene. Yes. One part of it. You know, and if they're having issues with the other parts, then they may rely less or more on my part, which is the actor. Yeah. So it's, you know, I can I can empathize and relate with them if they're struggling to get a scene to work, timing wise. Um, and then of course, absolutely vice versa. I think it's helped me the other way around. You know, yeah, oh, I mean, be, being an act and just being able to to com it helps you at the end of the day communicate your needs more oh, yeah. to each other. Know how to talk to actors, know how to talk back to directors, how to tell directors maybe what you need or what you have a question about. Um, I, 
that's it. It's just asking questions. Like I, there are too many times in films when I was starting off in my early 20s and I just didn't ask questions. When I was confused or whether I was like, it, and then I was like, oh, I don't want to bother them or I don't, you know, mm. I just won't say anything. Mm. Um, but my filmmaker brain there, seeing these other filmmakers work, I'm like, I wonder if they mean this. Mm. And now I'm at a point where I'm like, just ask, just mm. have open lines. Mm -hmm. And as much time as you can have before the shoot to have a through line. Yes. To talk, the yes. better for me. Yes. Like I, I, I've had the luxury, the gift, honestly, the privilege of like doing a few roles where friends, good friends, cast me in these roles that were a lot of work, good work, work that you get sweaty and tired from. But they gave me the time yes. to prep that. Yes. Like six months. Yes. What a gift. Yes. Not just a week out. Now, it doesn't mean that you may do the same performance. You may see a performance and be like, I didn't know that took you six months. Yeah. That could have taken you a week and maybe you get the same result. Right. You don't know yeah, you what don't it's going to be. But it's about but what for you me, need. But like that's you, what I know you, I would yeah. I would love. But again, it's a privilege and a luxury. Like you just, you can't be afforded that all the time. Yes. You know? Yes. And I have a feeling like some beasts was was like that, right? Having all that time. Absolutely. Some beasts and the ghost who walks, honestly. Oh, you had those, a lot of those, time with that too, huh? I had six months oh for that. Oh my God, that's amazing. And they're two very different roles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They got yeah. Motor mouth in them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I heard you say something though that it's like, you can you can have all that time, which is necessary and and needed. But there's a strange phenomenon that when you just touch the dirt, you're really connected into yes. this. Like you talked about that. Yes. Talk about that now. What, what is am, that phenomenon? For all my talk about talks about prep and yeah. phone calls and all that stuff, you have to have it. At some point. I don't. I won't feel comfortable unless, like, with some beast as an example. I don't. I don't put on those boots, and I and I I get my hands in the dirt in the garden. If I don't have those things, I'm loose. It's all theoretical. Yeah, it's that's all what cerebral. It is. Yeah, it's not tactile. But it's and so for me, if I know my first day on a film, even smaller role, but it's like some you know, but maybe it's a, a supporting role. I, uh, I'm like, when do I shoot? And I try to figure out a way to get there a day or two before to see the space. And if it's like, you know, a character, I'm in, uh, own a house in the scene, then I want to see the house. I want to mm. walk in the rooms. Mm -hmm. For me, that it, it's very important to feel that sweat and that dirt, because then it, it also, for any role that requires you to be process based, meaning process of that part. Yeah. If you're a banker and you're working in the vault yeah. and you're counting money. Yeah. I mean, it's like any actor will tell you, it's like you. it gives you that process to focus on so you're not thinking about the actor. Yeah. So if I learn how to be a farmer, even even just a, you know, a small part of being a farmer. Yeah. I'm not like a farmer. I was yes. only out there a little bit to prep, but that little bit helped where I just don't look like a total novice. Yeah, and it gives me the room to be able to focus on milking a goat and not saying the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To the other actor. Plus, in that case, though, I will say with some beasts is that one, it's one of my best friends directing, so you already feel very safe. Mm -hmm. And he comes from a documentary background, so there was definitely an observational approach, a slice of life approach. There's so much that was cut out of that film in particular that could have filled another hour of actual meat. Mm -hmm because he just would film me every day we would film. Even if it wasn't like a major scene, it wouldn't be a day wasted. Yeah, We would just go out and show me sitting. Yeah. Sometimes there, there would be shots of me just sitting, thinking for 45 minutes. Wow, yeah. And he's yeah. like, maybe I'll take a second of yeah. that and put it in the cut. Yeah. You know? yeah, that's really cool. I mean, that's that's like, it's almost like you're living the part then. Yes. Like, you know, you had all this time to prepare and then yes. you, even the filming is just living the role and it's it's funny that i for a long time would get so caught up sometimes in the trappings of a character that i was always looking for like the thing like what's the thing what's the physical thing to not be frank and when i got asked to be that role by cameron i remember i had that you know instinct that i had cultivated over a couple years like well what's the thing i need to do to try to be not me be a character and you're thinking so hard all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm not a farmer. 
I'm already yeah. not a farmer. Yeah. That's not me. Yeah. So don't think so much about the trappings for this. The trappings is your environment. The trappings mm. are inherent. They are there. Mm. You just being authentic and being real in that space is enough. So that's a really important lesson, it sounds like. Believing yourself, right? Yeah. In it and knowing it's enough. Not having like not needing this other thing that you're knowing never, when it's enough. When it knowing when yeah. it's enough. Yeah. Because yes. sometimes you might think it's enough, but then you realize you need more. <laughs> you, you need more, you know? Right. So like, I need saying, to go more. You know? <laughs> like, that's not enough, right? So you're yeah. saying you can believe it, but yeah. it's actually not true. Right. Oh, right. shit. Yeah. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why it's a collaborative thing, though, right? I mean, it's a collaborative Absolute, process. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> that's why, again, you have a director you trust yes. who can tell you. You know, yes. if you're on the right track or not. It's so interesting that, like, we were just talking about how you sometimes get cast as the... Scumbag. Scumbag. <laughs> the laconic yeah. scumbag. Yeah. You know, but then you can have, like, the ghost who walks, this really comic guy. And, and, and I guess I, what I'm saying is, like, I don't know how, how many actors can play both the scary guy, like you do in this film I just saw, Ken. Oh, you saw Ken. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, oh my God, yeah. thank you. Thank you for <laughs> yeah. warning me about that. Oh, yeah. do, you, do you objectively look at this stuff? And it might go back to you just being a filmmaker and being able yeah. to know, like, this is what's necessary for these, these kind of things. But was it a struggle to even convince people that you can play both of these kind of things? For a long time, right out of college when I was getting cast and I actually now I'm realizing saying this I didn't totally answer your question earlier where I started getting my first professional job which was right out of college like basically I, got, I started first getting professional work around like 2005 06 06 um, all indie stuff mm -hmm. and um, I was often cast uh, as the heavy yeah and I think it was only because I, you know, I think it's kind of cliche, but, you know, so many young actors, they, you know, both on the Pacinos, the De Niro's, all these guys. So they want to be, they want to show how forceful they are, yeah. not yeah. how restrained or gentle they can be. <laughs> they think they yeah. have to punch a hole in the wall. Like, that's my audition, <laughs> you know, like, Don, they walk out, you know. Yeah. But he's like, yeah, yeah, did I get it? Did I get the part? You know, like, really intense. And you're like, you're like whoa, 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 take it easy. Uh, so I, for a while, I was... And again, I think it helps I was acting, you know, as a kid, since I was a kid, always playing make believe and doing theater. Yeah. I always just wanted to insert myself into the movies as a kid I was in because I'm like, oh, what do I need to play? But they were all different yeah. parts even then. Yeah. So I think by the time I got to college and then right after college and started getting professional gigs, it was like, oh, where can I just fit in? So when I re would read a breakdown, it wasn't a sense of ego that made me think, oh, I, I think I can play all these different parts. It was like, oh, well, in my opinion, everybody can play any part. Yeah. I really believe that. Anybody yeah. can play any part. Now, you may not be the best person for that part. Yeah. But it, as long as you're being authentic, mm. you will, you will, that is the most important ingredient. Yes. Like in yes. Ken, I'm playing my version of that guy. Yeah. But there could be 10 other actors who would give different degrees yes. of how gentle or how scary they are. Yeah. So I think for a long time, I was always cast so much as the heavy. My poor mother always be like, when are you going to play a nice guy? <laughs> when are you going to play a, a dad and you have a kid and all this stuff, you know, and some beast comes around I'm like, mom, I finally got you something. Like, here's a, you come see this. I get to, you know, have a kid and play yeah. with this kid and be a little more romantic. Yeah. And that was a that was a gift because that was my friend Cameron seeing me tired of the scumbag part. Yeah, and he goes, "That's not the because Frank. That's not you know you. You're not hijacking planes all the time. Uh, you know with guns strapped to you. He's like, that's not you. So by him giving me that, I think that film actually opened up kind of some doors for me to then start, yeah. you know, playing introspective characters, which in some ways I feel is a little more like me because I, I don't consider myself. Uh, naturally an extrovert i think i have extrovertive bursts when i'm in my element but my go-to default is very pretty low-key kind of quiet 
Um, I feel comfortable that way. I keep my friends close. I prefer one on one like this instead yeah. of a group of six. Yeah. Um, but that film opened up a lot of doors. Um, but then again, you look at the stuff you were just talking about. It's not that farmer type. It's not yeah. that character. It's some other thing. Yeah. And so my opinion is that your work will always come in waves. Yeah. And I, this is just me speaking for myself, but it will come in waves based on whatever people saw you in last. Yeah. That's who you are to them. Yeah. Unless you're, you know, a movie star, you're somebody of note that people know a body of work. Right. If they don't know who you are, they only know what they just saw. Right. And then you have to work extra hard if you want a role that's not like the role you just played to prove to them that you mm. can do it. You know, and sometimes it's a, it's as stupid or as superficial as, as facial hair, you know. Yes. I remember I went in for a role one time and I, you know, I'm not saying I should have gotten the part even, but I they kept talking about the look, physical look <laughs> of the of the face and the hair and everything. And I and I, I wanted to say, like, you know, I can just shave off my, I had a full <laughs> beard. I was like, so I can fun. shave this off. And you, you'd be surprised, think like that. you'd be surprised at like how many casting directors, there's some amazing casting directors out there. But there are some, I, I feel like, uh, you, you wonder about the scope of, of what they could see versus how easy it is to investigate. Yes. And I think the problem is, again, you have friends who give you parts in these indie films that I'm in that I'm lucky to be a part of. They know your work. Yeah. They know who you are. Yeah. They know what you've done. They know what you want to do. Yeah. They're the people in, at this stage of my life, my career, they're the ones I rely on. Yeah. But casting directors and other people, like if you don't have anything big, you know, they only know what you send in. Yeah. And so you do have to fight and scrape a yeah. lot harder to get it, you know. And I, I mean, part of the reason why you said, do I even go for these different parts is I get bored easily. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, there, there's a, you know, if you play too many scumbags in a row, yeah. you're like, well, how's this scumbag different? Why should I even do it? Right. You know, right? How do I differentiate this guy? Um, Goes to walks was a good example. Yes. Even though Cody gave me that, the director Cody Stokes, he gave me that as a gift. If it had just been a script where it was this character being the goofy sidekick, without the last third of what happens. Yes. To I, I would have done it because it was my friend saying, "I want you to show up some comedy." And, look yeah. crazy I, I still would have probably done it but I wouldn't have been as hungry for it yeah if there wasn't that third act emotional pip yes that's why I said yes yes I was like okay there's the turn in this scumbag yes that I that I can yes. say yes a thousand percent to doing this yes. part yes and then you can you feel like you can really do that and you it's it's there's a depth there that you can reach which you hit and you thanks I mean, yes. but you, you know now where you're headed with that character. Yeah. The build. Ah, you know? uh, yeah. We even, it was something Cody and I talked about that we're like, I was very excited by this. But we were like, this guy never stops moving. He never stops talking the first two thirds. And as it gets toward the last three scenes, he becomes oh, yeah. stiller and doesn't always say something. Yeah. And because he's not saying something, it's both giving away that he's vulnerable. You're showing a different side, but it's also showing that he's a fucking rat. Yeah. That he's not, usually he's always saying something. Yeah. So you then don't trust the guy who's suddenly not saying something. Yeah. And it was a great thing to come up with Cody together. We're like, okay, we now have the first part. How do we build into that? Oh, here's a signifier. And how important is that to have like something to build toward? Like something that you're almost like you're secretly playing all along or playing toward. To me, that's everything. To me, I want to know how it ends on screen. Yeah. I don't care what happens to him. I, honestly, I, this is kind of funny. I think a little backstory is important, but I'm not a big backstory guy. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I want to know, I want to rehearse the scene and prep the scene that you're going to see. Interesting. Because in that scene, you can find ways to give kernels a backstory. Yeah. But I'm not real big into, it's this whole thing of like, the audience is going to project onto you whatever they want. Ooh. You can say your character had cereal for breakfast that morning. Yeah. And it's not talked about in the scene yeah. and the audience could think you had toast you know they're gonna put on to that whatever they want to see you know they yes. only know what they see so for me it was about what's my arc what am i building toward how good of a liar am i 
That's honestly one of the questions with any part I ask because we lie all the time as people. We lie in little ways, mm-hmm. big. We don't want to hurt somebody's feeling. We lie. Right. We're trying to hurt somebody, we lie. We're petty. We lie. We're hiding our vulnerability. We lie. And yeah. so, like for me, depending on how good of a liar you are as that character, will determine how much vulnerability you play the scene, how much you leak out. Yeah. You know, if you're a character that never has cried in any, but if there's your backstory, if you're playing a character who's never cried in front of anybody before, yeah, that's going to be a lot different of an emotional moment. Oh wow! You know. Yes. Um, yeah, because he finally got the waterworks to come. Yeah, for, for Ghost. I mean, yeah. it's like the guy's probably hasn't. You know, maybe, maybe he cries by himself, but I, I doubt he's cried in front of anybody. It's a sign of weakness. Yeah. If they see weak, they kill you in that kind right. of city. Right. You know. Right. So. For me, it's like, how much are you hiding all the time in the scene? Yes. It's all subtext. It's all always, and good writing is subtext. Yes. You never want the high moms that they always talk about in screenwriting, where they're literally talking about the thing. All the th- <laughs> Weather's nice. Hey, mom. <laughs> hey, Ted. You know? Where are you going next? <laughs> to the grocery store? And then it cuts to the grocery store. You know, whereas the editor is like, where are you going next? Cut to, we're in a grocery yeah. store. You yeah. reveal where they're at with a cut. So like, there's just yeah. so many things you, if you see those high moms in a script, even like, oh boy, yeah, this is gonna be. But but <laughs> what I'm hearing from you is that there's the equivalent of a high mom in the way you perform. In the in a character. In a character, yes. Well, because you want to know how much they give away. Right, right. So you, That's a high mom yeah. can be, how much do you, because you're, you're all, you're, Cameron and I talked about this with some beasts actually because we're like if, this is a film we said because we're like if this guy were really a farmer there's no cameras around yeah there's a scene in that movie that Cameron and I debated endlessly which was when I read a letter I get letters from my estranged girlfriend and her child and she sent me drawings and I get that letter and I did the first take and we watched it I don't move a muscle. Yeah. I just, I'm still staring at it blankly. The, it's the, what, the cooler shop effect, right? It's like yeah. We put on whatever we want yeah. onto that face. So I'm looking at it. And Cameron was like, I could use a little more, you know, something. Well, something. And I, he goes, you should be feeling really happy here. I go, I am. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, what do you, he goes, what do you mean? I was like, I am feeling it. I said, but when there's not a camera around, how often yes. do you really smile? I wonder, yes. Or it makes certain emotional gestures right. to, to people. Right. You, I, I don't think you do. I'm just speaking for myself. But like, I feel like the, there's a performative nature in everything. Yes. Because it's a movie, you have to give the audience something. That's the craft. And so yes. the craft is like then if you're playing a, a character who doesn't emote much, yeah. How do I give them just enough to show to they know what I'm thinking? It's clear, but it's still not too much because this character doesn't show much. Yeah. And it's that tricky balancing act. And we had like it was a beautiful little scene exercise to do because there were like six takes of range of mm. one that was kind of bigger and happier, like you know. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the probably good was for you to see that. Yeah. To see know. it. Yeah. It came well, off like that. Well, but coming from a guy, again, Cameron being a documentary filmmaker, is all about yeah. authenticity. I'm like, well, yes. if we're making this like a documentary, yes. then I wouldn't do Then you, you, it's contained. I'm so happy, but it's like, yes. you know. Yes. You know. Yes. It's, uh, that's, that's acting. It's like, it, how much do I give? Not what feels right. Yeah. It's never always about what feels right, but like, what's, what's best for the scene? On my way down here, I was thinking about, and I think you can relate relate to this, or I, I have a feeling you can. Like, mm. the Me Too movement actually changed my life in a way, and the and the the what I guess we would call the Black Lives Matter movement also changed my life. But a little bit before that, I feel like because I was riding down the street just now and looking at faces on the street on my bicycle. And I love, and I was realizing, I, I think I love this city because of all these faces. Like, you might live somewhere and you don't see a lot yeah. of these faces. Yes. So distinct. And I have this empathy for people 
that I never had before. That's amazing. It, it's That's really amazing. amazing. That's amazing. I mean, and it came about from these changes in society. It really did. I mean, I, I don't know if people believe that or they... A lot of people have problems with, with you know, what's happening. But I, I don't care. I, my yeah. life has changed. Yes. Like, and I, yes. and I know it because I have empathy. Yes. And uh, I was realizing that, like, this show is making me want to act, you know? And I'm thinking, like, it's weird that these two things are happening at the same time. Now. <laughs> it's weird. Okay? Yeah. So, <laughs> and you're making a gesture that you have something to say already, and I don't even want to interrupt. Go. I think, first of all, that's beautiful. Yeah. I, I myself, last year, was able to uh, vocalize my feelings with Black Lives Matter. I've been more vocal with my beliefs I've always held. Mm -hmm. to, um, growing up in Texas and being from mm -hmm. a part of Texas that was so conservative, not even from Austin, but from North Texas. And, and it was a thing to be able to vocalize those feelings. So mm -hmm. I'm totally mm -hmm. with you. I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think this might be a controversial idea. I think wanting to act that you feel and empathy that you've been feeling over this last year, I think they go hand in hand. Now, you could be an asshole and be a great fucking actor. Yeah. yeah. You could be. And so many are. My opinion, you'll be a better actor the more empathy you have for the person you play. Mm -hmm. I, I That's just what I believe. Maybe it's because I want to believe it. Yeah. You know, I don't have yeah. a, a way to... <laughs> to you know prove this statistically but uh, but my gut is that there's something with empathizing with other people being able to slip into their shoes to play these other roles yeah. I, yes. I think I think it opens you up to a kind of vulnerability that um, act, some actors are afraid to to give on screen and it's a I mean it's a love too right I mean it's a it's a weird I, I feel it from these actors that I talk to, I'm feeling it from you, man. I mean, like, there's a love of of people, and maybe that's also like this that is it, it, it creates an interest in people. And uh, in Li uh, your friend Lily Gladstone yes. said this, Wonderful. you know, uh, uh, somebody gave her advice that as long as you stay interested, you will be interesting. Yes. And I think that this is a part of it. Like how. How could you really be interested in people if you don't love them? Yes. You, like they or, go or hand in hand. There'll be this other kind of, if you don't love them, there'll be this other kind of removed interest. Like that is that you can't let you act them. Peter, a thousand percent. Peter. Yeah. A thousand, like that, that to me is like, if you don't like people, then you can't do it. You can't play them. You can't play people. You're going to go in hating them so much, which is why it's, you know, it's the old adage or whatever. You, if you play somebody who's an evil son of a bitch, he still, he's a human being. Yeah. You may not agree with his opinions, his feelings, what he does. Yeah. But he's still a, a person who has his own vulnerability in that personhood. Yeah. And I think to the point that Lily brought up, that's why I went through that funk. Mm. I was I was bored. I was restless. And mm. I because I, I was doing work that wasn't getting seen. And I was also like, why am I doing what I'm doing same reason why when it was playing scumbag six it's like well then you know how do I make this one different otherwise yes. I'm, getting, I'm getting bored it's like on the edge of like when I wanting to do any of those yeah you know yeah but then what that does is it pushes you to think outside the box it's a puzzle doesn't mean you'll use every idea you have but you'll it'll make you think but I think the root of it is empathy you know, I mean, it's a, it's like what we were talking about. You just saw Dear Mr. Brody. Yes. And to me, that that movie is yes. a is a it, it's a letter for empathy. It's a yes. movie about letters, and it's a movie. It's a message for empathy, a call to empathy. Yes. And yes. I, I think it's amazing that that film has come out during uh, 
during COVID. Yes. People are disconnected and and that they're, you know, so little empathy yes. with everything going on. Yes. You know. And it's amazing, like the one moment in that film where somebody says, well, I came here to get money, but I see how bad everybody else has it. And I think that- Yes. They, it's such a- I got teary eyed during ah. that moment. But then what I think is so interesting is the very next moment when they ask the other person in the hallway, like, why do you, what do you want the money for? And this woman goes, well, I want the exposure. I want to be seen. <laughs> I, I want to. I want to be. Uh, yeah. I want to yeah. be an actor. I want to be in movies. Oh, yeah, that's right. And they're like, "Well, how much money are you asking for?" She goes, uh, "One five thousand dollars." <laughs> it's like you can see her brain working, you know. But next to this person, he's like, "My mom's in the hospital," and she kind of, you know, steps aside. And I'm, I'm like, yeah. "Man, I mean, it's like that movie makes a very interesting assessment of what is need versus a want." Yes. yes. And how the lines blur. Sometimes. Yes. Yes. You know? Yes, and I, what was also fascinating about that is that it's just a, a, a great giving voice to all these letters and everything yeah. in people's lives. But it's also learning about that guy. That was, I mean, is Brody, yeah. another whole separate amazing well, story. That's Well, that's the thing that was so shocking to me when he told me he was going to, Keith told me he was going to make this movie. And I thought it was going to be about Brody. Right. It's Dear Mr. Brody. It's right. Tight, you know. And then he goes, no, I want to focus on the letters. He goes, because the more research we did about him, the more we went down a rabbit hole of just more questions, more questions, no yeah. answers. Yeah, yeah. And, and the guy was battling mental illness at a time that it was in its infancy in terms of treatment and assessment. Mm. And so um, he goes, I want to focus instead on the, the people. Because that's the thing that everybody can relate to. Yes. You know, it's true. Doesn't mean Brody himself isn't human. He has, you know, his right. flaws. He means well, but yeah. he has his flaws. He gets angry sometimes yeah. and hurts people. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's those. I think in some ways, it's so hurtful to these people who think that they have a shot at something. Yes. And that so shit's sad. never even seen. It's boxed up. So, so you know, like the, the in the guy that I played, I tried to look him up. Oh, really? Because I'm like, if I'm gonna play this guy, That's I mean, amazing. I think maybe it's the fr- only guy I've ever played who's like a, in a movie is like a based on something. Yeah. And I mean, it's only I'm in the movie like a couple minutes. Yeah, yeah. And yet I was like, if, uh, who is this guy? Yeah. What makes him, yeah, tick? And we couldn't find him. Uh, we don't know whether he wanted, whether he, committed suicide like he threatened to do in the letter mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. And though that was kind of disheartening and a little scary to wonder what happened, not knowing, um, because we looked up every, for re- every reenactor look, got to try to look up mm-hmm. who they were doing. But that also opened up like how to put Keith's stamp on it. Mm. Since we don't know what happened to the guy, then we are now free to do whatever yeah. interpretation we want, as long as it's empathetic. We're not painting this guy right. in a bad light. You know? Right. Uh, right. And I wonder how, how that would have changed your performance. Like if you did get yeah, to meet if him. Yeah, you if know? you knew more about him or something. Yeah. But, but it, that was all Keith. That was Keith being like, this is your letter. This is who you're reading. And this is uh, this is how I want you to look. Mm-hmm. This is everything. He just gave me this thing and said, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it made me realize again later how brilliant Keith was. Because the letter he chooses is about a guy who needs the money because he's contemplating suicide and Brody ends up committing suicide. Brody also burned down the house and there's a shot of my character with matches, lighting So there's all these little like small touches and cuts that I'm like, Keith, here. Just shout out to Keith Maitland, the director of this film. I just, it's a really um, special, special movie. Any idea what's happening with it? Is it going to be released? It's different... getting right now. It's they're looking. Distribution companies are eyeballing Boom. it. So Boom. hopefully we'll know more in a couple of months. But that's got a life. Special guy, special film. And if it doesn't, then I'm going to be the guy that lights something on fire. <laughs> okay? You heard it here first, folks. That <laughs> Rinaldi lights match. <laughs> I'm a fan of your films. Thanks, Peter. And I'm also very jealous of you, very jealous of you for one particular thing, oh. which I'll talk about. <laughs> uh, but my favorite film of yours is Parthenon. The simplicity of it is really, it's powerful. It's really powerful. That means a lot that 
yeah. it resonated with you because it, uh, it really does, and it will continue to. I think it, I think it's a it's a small masterpiece, man. I really do. I really do think that. Thanks, Pete. And I'm jealous of you because look, I made films just like you did when I was young. And when I hear you talk about those films, it brings me right back to me making my films with my friends that were so um, fun to do, but it was more than fun. It was just about the work. It was, we'd watch it together, but it's gone forever because something happened to me. I don't, I can't do that. Like maybe I can eventually, but I'm jealous of you because I think that never left you. The films you make are maverick films. You make uncompromising films. I feel, it feels like you're doing it for yourself and therefore I can watch something like Parthenon and all of your films. And feel this uh, like true art which is you're not trying to make this commercial you're not trying to make this acceptable you're expressing mm -hmm. and that's what i'm jealous about how do you keep that going you know i mean like you were just saying before like you haven't made money from from your, the films you make and it's yeah. like and is that is that part of it though is that the sad part of it that I can love it because it is that and it's separated from commerce? I, th I think you can, first of all, thank you. Somebody who has similar taste in films that, are, that give no fucks about being commercial will respond to films of that ilk. And so I think you, you already will want to maybe you see a film like that that doesn't mean it'll work. Doesn't mean the film, again, we talked earlier about like intentions versus the outcome. Mm -hmm. You know, you may step into the theater to see a film called Parthenon because it sounds in the log line like something that could be good, but maybe it didn't work. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't work for somebody else, you know. Um, I don't think that there's any um, formula. To keep making films with the, with a certain kind of passion, I know in my gut, in my heart, that I'm gonna make movies till I'm old and gray. I also know that the chances of me being able to live financially from the film world, uh, as I get older, especially, because I'd like to have a family and. Uh, it might not be sustainable to do it in the way I do it now and definitely how I not did it in my free willing early 20s. You can do anything and everything. Go out anywhere. Knowing that, and I don't know if you know this about me, side note, I substitute teach for money. Mm -hmm. I love kids. Mm -hmm. I love teaching. I know that I'll probably end up doing that more and more as I get older if I don't end up kind of being able to pay the bills consistently with acting or my mm -hmm. films. But even though I know all those, I, I know that that may be where I go. I'm never gonna stop making films because in my gut, it started so early in me. Mm -hmm. I even tried in my early 20s, Peter, I took a break for like three or four months. I was like, I'm not gonna write any scripts. I'm not gonna act anything. I went through withdrawals, man. <laughs> I did, I went through withdrawals. I couldn't stop. Yeah. I was addicted. Wow. And that's what I knew that no matter the form, whether it's commercial, if I make something more commercial, or I make something really abstract or hard to define for a lot of people, I'm just going to keep making it. My girlfriend, my partner, has taught me, she's a, a brilliant writer herself and actor, but she has taught me to be less precious and to try to create more and not think that it's the end of it. Yes, you can say you may not be able to make every idea you want to make by the time you're old and dead. Probably won't. So be precious about the making of the thing. 
but in the conception of the thing, be unprecious. Yes. Because you never know what's going to stick. And you never know what's going to lead to another thing. Yes. And I think if you had passion in your film at one time and making films, that hasn't gone away. I don't think. It's like riding a bicycle. Maybe that's a simplistic view, but to me, it's, it's buried in there. Unless you had a change of heart and it's not so much that you feel like you've lost how you love something but actually you feel that you don't love making movies anymore that's different but if you still feel the love and you still have a podcast where you talk about acting and filmmaking then it hasn't left you it's just getting that extra kick in the ass with it that extra shot in the arm to fire on all cylinders when you do it and I think the only way to do that is just to keep doing it Repetition. Mm-hmm. Repetition's everything. Just keep doing it. Something's going to stick. People so much today have this idea on like the young, out of nowhere filmmaker or actor who's like the hot shot. Like, look at this out of nowhere fresh voice. I have friends in their late 50s who've been making movies for decades, decades and decades and decades and decades. And their films aren't seen, and then sometimes one film will go to Sundance out of a sudden. And they go, wow, how was it making your first film? <laughs> like, I've been doing this forever. You just haven't seen it. Doesn't mean it doesn't mm-hmm. exist. And it doesn't mean that everything I made before is unworthy mm-hmm. just because this one got traction. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you're also, I think, to your answer your question in a different way, you're always going to be growing. I couldn't make Parthenon now. Mm. I had to make it then because of what I was going through. Mm -hmm. My mother doesn't like acting in my movies. I put her in one of my movies right out of college. And because it was the right day and the right time and she was in the right mood and my grandma was over and they were talking already about something sensitive, and I gave them a prompt and she did a scene and they both improvised a 20 minute scene crying. Mm. I didn't do anything. I didn't elicit that. I'm just the son with the camera. I came in, but my mom was in that right headspace where it was magic. Yeah. And, and, and we all knew at that table, that wasn't gonna happen again. You're not gonna do a second take. That was just something special happening in a moment. Yeah. And it'll never happen again. And I feel that way with every film you make. You could be somebody who wants to do an exercise and take the same script, make it every 10 years. See how it's changed. See how you've changed in the process. Are you more sympathetic, empathetic toward a character? And then the other character 10 years later, you see the flip side. Crazy part would be is what if they're all kind of similar? What does that say about you? But we're always growing. So I don't think you lost anything. I think it's in there. You just got to give it a different hat. Give it a different hat. I like that. Frank Mosley, thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. This was a pleasure, man. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.